Thank you. Um, feel free to ask questions. Don't be shy. Um, today I want to talk about a very simple problem and point out that there are things we don't understand you know, about very simple problems. This is the connected components problem. But let me start out with some general observations. I've been in computer science for a long time now, seen pretty much the whole development of the field of algorithms. And uh, uh, we computer scientists have developed lots of beautiful and uh, theoretically efficient algorithms. But there's a big gap between theory and practice. Lots of these algorithms have not yet been used in practice. And some of them, when people try to implement them, they get the details wrong, so the algorithms fail because they're not used right. Or if they are used, they can be less efficient than simpler methods that theoretically do not perform as well. Uh, so there's this gap between theory and practice. Yes, why? Well, software developers always have to work to deadlines, and the right thing for them to do, which is what they do, is to, in fact, choose the simplest method that's going to solve their problem. Uh, but sometimes they oversimplify, or they take some theoretical idea and simplify it in a way where it doesn't work. They don't necessarily understand it. And this can be dangerous. Or sometimes, and there are lots of examples actually, they will roll their own, build their own solution, and then try to, even though it may work well in practice, uh, they can provide a flawed efficiency analysis which confuses things for theoreticians. Now, how should we who value mathematical rigor respond? Well, uh, <clears throat> Develop and analyze simple methods, the simplest possible methods that will do the job. Even if the analysis is complicated, the algorithm has to be simple and it's going to be used in practice. And we should be applying theory to analyze and improve methods that have been used or could be used in practice. And also study methods on <coughs> data instances, problem instances that actually arise in practice if it's possible to do this. Sometimes algorithms, algorithms perform very poorly, but on instances that arise in practice, there may be some structure in the instances that one can exploit. And this is something we can study theoretically as well as empirically. And I would say to the practitioners, if you can get advice from a theoretician, an algorithm designer, bring that person in early, especially if you know you have to reach a meet a deadline, get feedback while you can actually take advantage of it. And if you can build an ongoing relationship with somebody who understands the details of algorithms and data structures, you may get not just short-term payoffs, but very long-term gains that are unpredictable, actually. Uh, good, so much for the pontification. Now, these things have kind of driven me in this direction, especially in the last five or ten years, of trying to find simple algorithms, what I'll call reference algorithms. Paul Erdős, who was a famous mathematician, had this wonderful, he had many wonderful uh, kind of eccentric ideas, but one of them was the book of proofs, proofs from the book. This is the book in the sky, with the perfect proofs of all mathematical theorems. So the goal is to devise algorithms from the, the book up there, algorithms that are as simple as possible, provable resource bounds for important input classes, efficient in practice. <clears throat> now, as computers get faster and faster, and memories get bigger and bigger, the design space only increases. So it's important to systematically explore the design space of algorithms. Uh, in the early days, uh, it was easy to find interesting results. People took problems, found what seemed to be satisfactory solutions, didn't necessarily explore the design space systematically, possibly overlooked even simpler or better methods for some problems. Einstein is supposed to have said something like, make everything as simple as possible, but not simpler. Understand the problem in its fundamentals. And Get it as simple as possible. Okay. 
So the connected components problem, possibly the most basic graph problem. The graph here is just a collection of vertices and pairs of vertices which are edges connecting them. We're dealing with undirected graphs. Two vertices are connected if there's a path between them. And a connected component is just a maximal set of vertices. Maximal set of vertices pairwise for each one. So our problem is to find the components of a given graph. Here's a simple graph. How many components? One, four, three. OK. We've got a big component here, this guy. Single vertex, no edges. Here's it. How many components? Three. Three. How many components? <laughs> Not so easy. I think there are actually three in here, but depending upon the picture, I mean, humans are really good at something like this because the components are spread out. All right. So if we want to compute the components, we need a way to represent them. Here is one way. Uh, Let's label all the vertices in each component with a distinguishing vertex, a unique vertex in the component. Then we can test if two vertices are in the same component by comparing their labels. Okay, so that's the way we're going to define the problem. This labeling can be arbitrary, but we have to end up with every vertex on the component labeled with the same label. And two vertices in different components labeled with different labels, and I'm going to assume that the labels are in fact vertices within the components. Furthermore, let's assume that we have n vertices, just the numbers 1 through n, and m edges. This means we can define a special labeling, which I'll call the minimum labeling, which is just pick the minimum vertex in each component as it's named. Okay. So here is a connected graph, one big component. And the minimum labeling is this one. These are the vertices, these are the labels. Everything is labeled one because it's the smallest vertex of the component. Now, this problem is easy to solve <coughs> sequentially, that is, with a single processor algorithm. And there are actually two rather different ways to do it. One is to use graph search, your favorite kind of graph search, breadth first search, depth first search, any kind of graph search will find the components in linear time. This is a graph algorithm solution. There is another more data structure type solution, which is to use a disjoint set union data structure. Or sometimes called a union find structure. What is the disjoint set union problem? <clears throat> it is to maintain a collection of disjoint sets, each initially a singleton, and each set having a unique canonical element subject to two operations, unite, which takes two elements, and if they are in different sets, unites the two sets, and chooses a canonical element of the new combines. The algorithm gets to choose the canonical element in this framing of the problem. That's the update operation, and the access operation is find, which returns the canonical element of the set containing X. It's an abstract problem, it's a data structure problem. How do we use it to solve the connected components problem? For each edge, we unite the ends of the edge. I'll use brackets to denote undirected edges because I'm going to represent eventually an undirected edge by a pair of directed edges, one in each direction. We'll get to that in a bit. Uh, so we start out with all the vertices and singleton sets. We process each edge. If we have an edge connecting two vertices in different sets, we put the sets together. And we, in the process, we compute a canonical element for you. Keep track of a canonical element for each set, and it's up to the algorithm to do that. Then at the end, we 
run over all the vertices, and for each one, we define the label to be the canonical element of the set containing. <coughs> now, the general version of disjoint set union, you are allowed to arbitrarily intermingle unite and find operations, but this is a special use of disjoint set union in which all the unites precede all the finds. And also, if we want a more relaxed interpretation of the problem, we don't really have to run the second <coughs> loop. We just need to use find whenever we want to do a test for two vertices doing the same component. We just do the find on each end. At that point, we do the test. Opportunistically using find rather than doing this entire computation, which might do some unneeded work. But for purposes of the way I've defined the problem, this will complete itself. Now, I haven't told you how to implement the data structure. But there are good implementations that represent each set by a rooted tree and transform the trees appropriately. And I don't want to go into the details of this, which is kind of interesting. But if you use graph search, you can solve connected components in linear time. And if you use disjoint set union with the right data structure, it is also linear time. And this bound relies on the fact that all the unites, all the updates precede all the files. The data structure is a compressed tree or compressed forest with path compression. Um, <clears throat> this solution is more general because the disjoint set data structure allows intermixed unites and finds. So you can, for example, do single edge insertions or batch edge insertions and determine using the find operation whether two vertices are in the same set after you've done some number of um, <clears throat> insertions. Uh, in this more general setting, instead of constant time per edge, there's an inverse Ackerman function amortized overhead. This is for all practical purposes, constant, and I don't want to go into the details of this either at this point, but even this very simple problem in the sequential realm, very simple algorithm has a rather strange running time with a fairly complicated analysis. And then if you want to allow edge deletions, things become even more interesting, and Monica and her colleagues have worked on that version of the problem. But let us get back to the basic problem and ask, is this the end of the story? Linear time, this is the best we can hope for if we're doing sequential computation. And for medium-sized graphs, even large-sized graphs, these algorithms are simple enough to be quite practical. But is there more to be said? What happens if the graph is really big? Uh, this is something like product life cycle management. This is a graph representing product life cycle management. I'm not sure what the set of products in here is, but now this isn't so big from the computer's point of view, but it's kind of big from the human point of view. Here's another one. This represents protein interactions, I think. Uh, I don't know what this one represents. This is some slice of a social network. And if you look at the Facebook network, or you look at the internet, or you look at uh, the World Wide Web, you end up with really huge graphs, and people actually want to compute connected components on really huge graphs. And there are even applications where the graph is implicitly defined by some process. So we visit a vertex. And there's some computation that tells you what the adjacent vertices are, and then you can get really, really enormous graphs. Billions of vertices, trillions of edges. So 10 to the 9th, 10 to the 12th, and these will get bigger over time. Now maybe sequential algorithms are not fast enough, even if they're linear time. And we know that computers maybe are reaching Moore's limit. People are starting to build more and more 
cores into computers? Can we take advantage of concurrency of multiple processors to speed up the computation? That's the problem here. So can we speed up the computation using potentially lots of processors? We can think of as many as constant number per edge or vertex if we want to. So this is unrealistic, but it gives us some idea. And if we can get solutions here, we can always uh, sequentialize them, use fewer processors, and we don't lose efficiency. Now, in this setting, there are two flavors of computational model. One of them is common memory model, parallel random access machines that we're going to use here. And there's also a distributed memory model or a message passing kind of model. I'll say a little bit more about the details. The algorithms I'm going to talk about are simple enough that it's straightforward to implement them on your favorite computer model subject to certain constraints that I want to talk about. So we'll start out with, we'll think about this, this model. So um, we've got a common memory, a bunch of processors, one per edge, a few per edge, a few per vertex, with some private memory. They can read and write into uh, read from or write into the common memory, and they're all running in lockstep, which means in particular that they all read at the same time, and they all write at the same time. And then the question is, how do we handle uh, read and write conflicts? I will get to that, but before I do, let's take a look at an algorithm here. This is a naive algorithm, which is kind of a brute force everywhere, breadth first search sometimes called label propagation, although this, this term is used for other algorithms as well. I'm going to use here v dot p to represent the label of vertex v. Initially, we self-label every vertex. And then we repeat this loop, which runs over the arcs. Now I'm representing each edge consisting of an unordered pair of vw by two directed pairs from V to W and from W to V just to make this code simpler to state. So for each edge here, we look at the VW direction and the WV direction. For each such arc, we ask, is the label of V less than the label of W? If so, we replace the label of W by the label of V. These two vertices are in the same connected component because there's an edge between them. We're making the label of this one smaller because the label of this one is a candidate. We keep doing this until no pair changes. <coughs> this loop doesn't matter, but this loop is running synchronously in parallel over all the arcs, and in particular, these writes all happen at the same time. All the reads happen. The two labels get read, and then all the rights that the condition is met happen at the same time. And the rule is that we allow multiple rights to the same location, but the winner is the smallest value. So this is a particular uh, tie-breaking rule for concurrent rights, and I'll get to some more details later. But so if if this label gets changed because of several edges, several arcs trying to change it. The smallest value wins. Uh, it's straightforward that, to prove that this algorithm is correct. How fast is it? Well, let's run it on an example here. You can see it's good on graphs with small diameter, that is, small maximum path length between pairs of vertices, and bad on graphs of large diameter. And this is a, one component with large diameter, single path, so it's not so good on this, this graph. So here, here's the initial vertices, initially all self-labeled. After the first round, this edge causes the one to become the label of four, four to become the label of six. Seven has two choices. This edge tries to write six to seven's label, and this edge writes five to seven's label, and five wins. Uh, three gets two, 
and two and one are local minima, so they retain their own values. And what happens basically is the one has to propagate all the way around to the two, and eventually everybody ends up labeled as one, and I won't go through all the details, but hopefully after whatever that is, six rounds or so, everybody's correctly labeled. And the algorithm stops. <clears throat> So this thing is taking something like the diameter here. Um, so why am I thinking of labels as parents? All the algorithms I'm talking about are very simple. They're, they're keeping a label for every vertex and updating the labels of the vertex. And most of the, uh, the algorithms that I'm going to describe in detail compute the minimum labeling, and they're always reducing the labels. So if we think of a label, I'm sorry, a vertex and its label as an arc, directed edge, that gives us a directed graph in which each vertex has out degree one. So this is a digraph, and furthermore, if we can guarantee that the only cycles are self-loops, and the digraph consists of a collection of rooted trees, and the label is the parent of a vertex in the set of rooted trees. So that's why I want to think of these as parents. And it helps in the analysis to think about this collection of trees that is really representing what the labels are. Okay. Uh, in particular, we can guarantee that we don't create cycles if the labels always decrease. And that's what we're doing. Um, ultimately, we want one tree per connected component, and it's going to be flat, because the parent of every vertex is going to be the unique label, which is going to be the root of the tree. So I'll use the term flat tree to denote a tree in which there's a root, collection, possibly a collection of children, no grandchildren, nothing more than one step away from the root. So we want to convert the initial singleton set into a bunch of trees, all flat, one per component. That's another way to think about what we're trying to do. Okay, now back to the label propagation algorithm. How many rounds does it take? This is steps. This is essentially time, some constant, uh, this constant time per round, because each of these rounds is going to take constant time. Because every, you've got one process per arc doing the computation, and it's only constant number of steps per round per, per arc. Uh, well, uh, proportional to D in the lowest case where D is the maximum diameter of the component. Uh, this is straightforward to see. Basically, the path is the bad example, and it's really doing breadth first search from the smallest vertices in the components, which gives this as an upper bound, plus some extra work. And the extra work is kind of a killer. So, on small diameter graphs, this is a fine algorithm, but on big diameter graphs, it's not such a good algorithm. Nevertheless, uh, people who solve this problem on big graphs, uh, there's, a, there's work implementing this algorithm and trying to claim that it's good, which it really isn't. The, the sequential algorithms destroy this algorithm even on highly parallel systems and huge graphs. But maybe we can do better. And indeed we can, and the crucial idea is to use what I will call shortcut. Uh, in other contexts it's been called compress. If you know about PRAM algorithms, there's a break and compress strategy, and that's this is the compress part. It's known as halving in the disjoint set union literature. Uh, basically what it does is it runs over the vertices, and for each vertex it replaces its parent by its grandparent. So if we have a long path 
of labels. So I got V label of V, label of label of V, and so on. It hops. And, uh, there's some other word for this that people use that has to do with this fact that you're bypassing every other node. Basically, it takes a long path, and splits it into two paths, each about half the length. So if you start out with a deep tree and you run logarithmically many rounds of this thing, logarithmic in the maximum path, like you're going to flatten the tree. And we can hope by using uh, this combined with appropriate label updates based upon the edges to maybe get an algorithm that takes logarithmically many rounds. Logarithmic in a number of vertices. Now here is an algorithm which might have a log in bound. I'm calling the algorithm P for parent connect. Uh, the connection step, which is right here, alternates with the shortcutting step, which is right here. And uh, in the, in the uh, label propagation algorithm, I had the label of W here, W dot P. And this is also W dot P. But here I'm taking the label of the label of W. The label of V is less than the label of the label of W. I'm going to replace the label of the label of W by the label of W. I call this the P for character. So we do this loop. Each loop does the connect step here followed by a shortcut step, and we keep doing this until no further changes. Very simple enough. Let's run this on an example, same example. Okay, the connect step, these vertices start out self-labeled, so it does the same as label propagation on the first step. 4 gets 1, 6 gets 4, 7 gets the minimum of 5 and 6, which is 5, 3 gets 2, 5 gets 3. And then we do the short, uh, so let's see what we've got here. I didn't draw the arcs corresponding to the, the trees, but 7 points to 5, the label of 7 is 5, 5 points to 3, 3 points to 2, 6 points to 4 to 1. Now I do the shortcutting step. And 6 is going to now point to 1 because this goes 2 steps, 6 point to 1. 7 points to 3 and 5 points to 2. And that's over here. 5 points to 2, 7 points to 3, 6 points to 1. And now we do another connect step, parent connect step. And we get pretty close pretty fast. This example is too small to show, but on a long path, this thing, rather than taking linear number of rounds, takes logarithmically many rounds. And indeed, we conjecture that this algorithm, oops, that algorithm, takes logarithmically many rounds, although we don't have to come, I'll come back to this later. Why is this algorithm hard to analyze, even though we have this nice shortcutting in here? One problem is that this connect step is very powerful. If you think about the trees that exist in the middle of the process, this connect step can actually break a subtree off and reconnect it to some other tree. It's non-monotonic in that sense. And this seems to make algorithms hard to analyze. Uh, it does maintain trees, it doesn't create any cycles, but it can split a component by moving a subtree to some other place. It would be nice to have an algorithm that's completely monotonic. Once it combines two parts of a component, we want them to stay together. We call an algorithm monotonic if it doesn't split. Tenet. Uh, so this seems to be, this problem of non-monotonicity makes this algorithm hard to analyze. But we can 
get a monotonic algorithm just by restricting the way we do the connection, basically we want to only connect a root to some other vertex. We want to restrict the connect step so it only connects a root. And that gives us this algorithm, which is the same as the previous algorithm, except I've got this wrong here. This should say if v dot p is less than w dot p dot p, which equals w dot p, then replace w dot p dot p by v dot p. My apologies. I don't know what's wrong with this. This is a different algorithm. This is the algorithm. <laughs> Right. So this is the same as algorithm connect, except I put in this additional test here. I only change the parent of w dot p if this thing is a root. It's self-labeled. That guarantees monotonicity. Now, actually, this algorithm it should be called algorithm A does the same thing in a different way. Right? It, it, it does the connection step in a more direct way, but it also modifies the, the arcs as it goes along. But that's a story perhaps for another time. Now this algorithm we can actually prove something about. Uh, but most interestingly, these very simple algorithms seem to be completely new in spite of the vast literature on this problem. And let's see what's going on here. I, I want to talk about a little bit about how we can actually analyze this algorithm. This algorithm we can prove runs in logarithmically many rounds. So it's linear number of processors, one per arc and one per vertex. Runs in log n rounds. Seems to be extremely fast in practice. And it's very minimalistic. I mean, if you can come up with something simpler, well, <coughs> where did the algorithm go? Algorithm A, P. Algorithm P is simpler, but we don't know how to prove anything about it. Okay, how many rounds? Before I get into the analysis, let's go back and look at the history of connected component algorithm, parallel connected component algorithms. Uh, to my way of thinking, there are kind of two eras of research on this problem. The first one was the theoreticians, uh, who used the parallel random access model mostly when studying this problem and many other similar problems. starting in the 1980s, early 1980s, extending to the 2000s and even until relatively recently. The goal was to minimize the time in the total work, which is the number of processors times the time. And the assumption is that everything is running synchronously and you've got the same number of processors at every time steps in the total work as the product. And you would like this to be as close to linear as possible because we know that with one processor, total time is linear and the total work is linear. Uh, so the goal was to get good bounds even if the algorithm got a bit complicated, or even more than a bit complicated. So let's go into a few more details of the PRAM model. As I said, each process has a small private memory and there's a large shared memory. Processes run synchronously in lockstep. They can do private computation, and that doesn't have to be synchronized. But on the reads and writes, we assume they are synchronized globally. Now, there are several variants of this model, depending upon how we allow, how we handle read and write conflicts, on whether we allow them. So the most restrictive model is the EREW, or Exclusive Read, Exclusive Write model, in which you cannot have two reads from or two writes to the same location in the common memory at the same time. Uh, now, 
con uh, uh, concurrent reads of the same location are easier to implement than, than concurrent writes because you have to resolve who wins on the right, whereas the thing that gets read is the same for everybody. So the next model in the series allows concurrent reads, but not concurrent writes, exclusive writes. The most general model is concurrent read, concurrent write, and there are variants of this model depending upon how the uh, write conflicts are resolved. The most restrictive is the common model where everybody has to write the same thing, otherwise there's an error. The more or less standard model that most of the research uh, used is the arbitrary model where one of the rights succeeds, but the algorithm has no control over which. And you have to assume it's the one that makes the algorithm perform as poorly as possible. Stronger models are the last two. The priority model assumes that the processes have priorities and the one of highest priority wins if there's a conflict. So this is resolution on the basis of process. The combining model of resolution is on the basis of the values. The values that are concurrently written are combined using some symmetric function, like minimum or sum, and the combined value is written into the location. So the model we've been assuming is the combining CRCW model, and the combining operation is me. Now this is not so realistic, perhaps, in the PRAM setting, but the PRAM is kind of an obsolete model of a concurrent computer these days, and it's very realistic in a more distributed and a more realistic uh, concurrent model. All right. So, the theoreticians mostly worked in one of these three models. The goal was to get the best possible bounds using the weakest possible model, which would be this one. And I don't think there was a lot of work in this model, which allows for simpler algorithms. Notably, Shalowak and Vishkin in 1982 for the arbitrary CRCW period produced an algorithm that runs in log n steps with a uh, linear number of processors, so n plus n log n total work. So this is the logarithmic overhead on the work as compared to a sequential algorithm, but much faster. It's a labeling algorithm. It does not maintain minimum labels. It does maintain trees, and it's monotone. Um, it does two shortcuts per round. <coughs> and a couple of connect steps per round. It doesn't actually need the two shortcuts. At least they claim in their paper that you can get away with one. There are extra steps and some extra computation to guarantee that. So these algorithms are all combining some kind of shortcutting strategy with some kind of tree combination strategy. And if you combine trees arbitrarily, you can build up long paths that then have to get flattened out. And one issue is that if you have a bunch of flat trees that you already flattened out, it may take them some time to connect to some other tree. And this poses a problem for the analysis. So their algorithm is complicated, and it's complicated in particular in order to make sure that every tree that gets flattened and just sits there for a round will get combined with some other tree. So we can reduce the number of trees by a constant factor, uh, essentially each round or maybe each two rounds, which is part of proving this log n bound. The analysis, yes. The, the log n is log diameter, actually? Or? No, it isn't log diameter. I can come back to this point. In fact, uh, for these algorithms that only connect roots, you can construct fairly easily constant diameter graphs that still take log in number of rounds. That's a good question. <coughs> Analysis is not straightforward. I'll return to this point right here. So this is a classic result that everybody refers to. But it was 
It's overly complicated, and it was the first step that got people going on the problem. Um, they, they give an example in their paper that shows that a simpler version of their algorithm, which essentially doesn't do this extra stuff, uh, fails. It takes linear number of steps in this case. And actually, this very example is a bad example for this algorithm R, this very simple algorithm <coughs> that I proposed. In the arbitrary CRCW, and this shows that if you want to get a significantly simpler algorithm, it seems that you need a more powerful model. Now, I believe that this is a perfectly realistic model for present day computing. In fact, it's kind of a weak model for present day computing, so why not take advantage of it if it simplifies the algorithm? So, Things change over time as models <coughs> develop. And computer science is some mixture of, well, it's the art of computer programming, so there's art in it, there's mathematics, there's science, and there's engineering. You're trying to develop theory that's realistic, so our computing models have to be realistic, and what's realistic is changing over time. Uh, okay. So, our book at Shaw came up with a simpler version of the Fishkin Shaw Fishkin algorithm, and it's got a simpler analysis too. Uh, Rife, uh, in between, came up with a very simple. These algorithms are deterministic. Rife came up with a very simple, randomized algorithm uh, with the same kind of bounds. It maintains all trees being flat. It restricts the connection steps so it only puts pairs of flat trees together and does a shortcut which makes everything flat again and it iterates that process. And it uses randomization to guarantee that it only puts pairs of trees rather than multiple trees together so the paths don't get longer than two steps. Um, so it's very simple, but it does use randomization. There's one algorithm in the lit all the algorithms in the literature that we found, except for this one, uh, maintain trees. They don't create cycles. But this algorithm, interestingly, does in fact create cycles. It's on the concurrent read exclusive right model, so it's a weaker model. Uh, and it's a little bit slower. This is log to the power of three halves of n. Uh, and the most interesting thing about it is the fact that in the process of doing the connect steps, it does create cycles, and it uses a shortcutting process, or what amounts to shortcutting, to squeeze the cycles down until they disappear. So you can shortcut on a cycle just as easily on a long path, and after logarithmic iterations, uh, the cycle dissolves, basically. Uh, now, there's a huge literature with lots of ideas besides the short cuttering and the labeling and arc, arc modification. Um, kind of the culmination of this work was that of Halperin and Zwick, who presented two related but somewhat different randomized algorithms in the weakest model, exclusive read, exclusive write, logarithmic in n number of rounds. And this is not correct. This is n plus n over log n processor. So the work is linear here. The work is linear. The number of processors is less by a factor of log n than all these other algorithms we've been talking about. This is a masterpiece. This work is a masterpiece, but it's incredibly complicated and um, I think hopeless to implement in practice. And if one did implement it, it's probably not going to run as fast as simpler algorithms. Um, so all of these algorithms are monotonic. They maintain trees or trees are single cycles in them, and they combine trees, and they don't rip the subtree off and stick it somewhere else. 
Now, there's a second era with the advent of the internet, the World Wide Web, social networks and so on, people got really interested in computing components and other properties of huge graphs. And with the advent of cloud computing and multiple processors and so on, people got interested in actually running parallel algorithms in practice. And the computing model changed. It turned into some kind of distributed or message passing model uh, based on things like Mapreduce and Heap. So, the goal, so it was now practitioners trying to implement algorithms and mostly studying their experimental performance, getting ideas from the previous work by the theoreticians, sometimes using the algorithms, but often simplifying or extracting ideas and building their own algorithms, and uh, looking at running times and other characteristics, experimental characteristics on actual instances. So the goal was speed in practice, an algorithm that one could actually implement in the whatever computing framework they were. So um, the systems guys didn't necessarily want to spend the time to try to, well, I shouldn't speak for them, but they dismissed some of these existing PRAM algorithms, claimed they couldn't be implemented in these frameworks. These frameworks are actually more powerful than the PRAM model, so all these algorithms can be implemented in a distributed model. So this is ridiculous. Uh, they did invent some simpler algorithms, and in particular, there are several algorithms in the literature that are non-monotonic, that actually do move subtrees around. And they claim things like logarithmic number of, logarithmic and n number of rounds, but flawed proofs at best. So, so the model is, we have a bunch of processes. They have a local memory. There's no common global memory. Again, we'll assume everybody runs in lockstep, but in one step, all the processes can do some amount of computation, up to an unbounded amount of computation. And they can send messages to other processes that they know about, and they can receive messages. So you can think of it as a round of receiving messages, doing computation, sending messages, and let us ignore both inbound and outbound message contention to keep things simple. Now, let's, this is kind of a general model, let's restrict it a bit for our problem. We'll assume there's one process per edge and vertex. Uh, initially, the edges know the, vert the vertices, but the vertices know nothing. So this is going to allow me to get a lower bound in this, in this model. That's, that's what this is to say. So every vertex process eventually has to know the label that's associated with its component. Initially, the edge processes can communicate with the two vertices that they know about, and then the vertices can start doing stuff. You need order log d steps you know, to compute components because uh, if you have a long path, the best you can do is a doubling process in this model. Uh, so this is the, this is the diameter, the maximum path length in a component. I'm sorry, maximum distance in any component. So the, the maximum shortest path between pure vertices is fine. Um, <clears throat> You need log d steps, because the best you can do is this doubling process. You can make that rigorous with this assumption. And you can, in fact, do it in log d steps if you send very large messages. Basically, every round, everybody floods everybody it knows about with all the other vertices it knows about in its component. And the double, you get the doubling process, but the messages get huge. So this is an unrealistic algorithm. But this is a target. This is a lower bound. This is log d, not log n. On these graphs that we're interested in, 
the diameter is probably much smaller than n. Might, might be logarithmic in n or polylogarithmic in n or some uh, fractional power of n, but this might be a lot better than, than log n. So if we could actually achieve this with a realistic algorithm, that would be a nice thing. Um, the PRAM algorithms, if you translate them into this framework, and it should be algorithm P and R, use messages of log n bits, which is what one should assume is a realistic assumption. Basically, you send a constant number of vertices, constant number of labels, or maybe even one in each message. Uh, so these algorithms can be implemented in this model, and it doesn't change the bounds. Now, here are a couple of these papers that kind of got things wrong. Um, these guys for Yahoo, which has now both proposed an algorithm that's something like algorithm A that I didn't talk about and algorithm P, but it does a more complicated kind of connect step which guarantees linear and diameter rounds. And they have a variant of shortcutting that mixes old and new labels. But they, they claim to found a logarithmic number of steps, but the proof makes no sense. Nevertheless, this algorithm runs really fast in practice. They built their own pro platform, which they call Kronos. Um, they, uh, Part of the reason this algorithm runs fast in this network is because they have clever ways of handling message convention and doing other optimizations. And all of these things have an effect when you're actually doing experiments. And experimental algorithms, algorithmics is an important and, I would say, underappreciated and misunderstood field. One has to be very careful to get results that are meaningful when doing experimental evaluation of algorithms. In any case, uh, it turns out Costas was another ex-student of mine, and I found out about this paper and came to the conclusion this was wrong and got curious about this whole area. And this is what got us started on our research a couple of years ago. Well, this paper was in 2018, so last year. Um, Here's another one with a different framework. They proposed a simplified version of the shalowak vishkin algorithm. <coughs> they claimed the log n bound, but on the shalowak vishkin example, it runs in linear rounds because they didn't resolve the right conflicts arbitrarily. They kind of misunderstood the problem. Here's another one. This, this, those two papers got published in reputable system conference. This one is on archive, and I think it hasn't yet made it to a conference. It's an interesting algorithm in that it splits each edge into two arcs directed in opposite directions, which it then modifies independently of each other. Now, he claimed an order law of D round back, which would be spectacular if true. Unfortunately, um, there's a counterexample in a paper by another group. So this bound is false. It's not clear whether this algorithm runs in log n time. This algorithm also adds arcs to the graph, and he claims that the number of arcs is always a uh, constant factor times the number of original arcs, but that proof is wrong also. So. Uh, this is kind of a mess. Th this is one of the few that didn't do any experiments. He made lots of claims, but he didn't actually experiment with this. this okay, so uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff out there that needs to be cleaned up. We can prove a bound for algorithm R for the. Uh, CRCW PRAM with right conflicts resolved using minimization. Um, using an analysis that is a, related to the analysis of uh, our book and Shalot, the analyses of the previous algorithms all operate around at a time. 
a difficulty. And, and as a result of that, these algorithms were designed so that they would guarantee combination of trees each, each time, uh, each round. This algorithm, you can create a flat tree that sits for a long time. It's connected to something, but it's connected at a deep spot in a tree with a long path in it. And eventually the halving process squashes this tree and connects this one in, or co connects one to the other somehow. But it can take a non-constant number of rounds. So analyzing something like this is not so easy. But it turns out that we can combine this analysis with some model ideas to prove this, this bound for this algorithm, which is simpler than anything in the, in the literature. Uh, and here's the key fact. We define a potential function, which is something like the sum of the heights of the active trees, the ones that don't change in the round. And this decreases by a constant factor every constant number of rounds. So the maximum this could be is linear in n. If it goes down by a constant factor, and after log n rounds, it's down to nothing, and all the trees have to be flat. And they all have to be combined. Um, so this is the idea, but to make this more precise, which I will do very quickly here, let me go into a few more details. So uh, after two rounds, there are no singletons except for isolated vertices. So every tree has at least two vertices in it. We call a tree passive in a round if it does not change during the round, and active if it does. These are the problem children, and they can linger for a long time. We we'll define the potential of a single tree, an active tree, to be its height measured in num maximum number of edges on the path, plus one, plus one extra if it's flat. So the height of a, the potential of a flat tree is one plus one plus one, which is three. So the height of a height one tree is three. The potential, the potential of a height one tree is three. The potential of a height two tree is also three. The potential of a height three tree is four, and so on. This, th this is one per tree. This is this comes from some crazy details of analysis. Passive trees have to have potential zero because they linger for a long time. If you give them positive potential, you can't prove what you want to prove. All right. So if T is an active tree at the end of some round, let's look backward in time to look at the trees that were put together to compose it. We'll call those the constituent trees. Constituent trees in round J are the ones of this tree T, which is around K, are the ones that got put together to form it eventually. This algorithm is monotonic. It's only putting trees together, so this definition makes sense. We'll define the potential, Tj, of T in round J, to be the sum of the potentials of its constituent trees. And we want to show that this decreases sufficiently. So uh, here's the starting point. The potential can never increase in a round. It can only stay the same or go down. And if you go for five rounds, the potential drops by a factor of four thirds. To prove this result and get the whole thing, you get the log in number of rounds. And I think in the interest of time, I will forget the rest of the proof sketch and get to the interesting fact here. So the question was asked about log D. Uh, turns out that very recently, and I think this was Fox, 1918, this paper by Andoni et al, they gave a complicated and randomized algorithm on a very powerful version of a distributed computer model uh, so linear number of processes, and their, their round bound, their time bound is log d times log log of n. And with this log, the base is the graph density, essentially the number of edges divided by the number of vertices. 
So this gets pretty close, except it's in the distributed model, and it uses a lot of the power of this model. They have to be able to do sorting in constant time, constant parallel time, which is a bit of a stretch. But it turns out that the, the and, and the idea here is very nice. It is to use this flooding idea, but to control it so the messages don't have to be too big. And there's a bootstrapping process that goes on where uh, as you get more and more, uh, as the trees get combined, you get fewer and fewer of them. And the only thing that matters really is how many trees there are. And the graph density essentially goes up. The number of vertices goes down, which allows you to speed up the process, which accounts for this log-log factor here. And uh, recently, Cliff Liu, my co-author on the work I described, and me, and one of the co-authors on this paper, <coughs> Palin Zhang, have been able to implement this not on the, on the standard CRCW model, the arbitrary CRCW model. Um, so we don't need constant time sorting. And the main algorithmic tool turns out to be hash. So this is randomized. Um, yet to be, oh, actually, we have a draft of this. So you can get close to log D. Um, this is a pretty good battle. Now I should say that the experiments by the Oath people, the empirical observed running time was something like log d plus log log n, or maybe the max of log d and log log n. So uh, these simple algorithms on the graphs, huge graphs that occur in practice, seem to run in something like something related to this amount of time that we can't prove anything. So that's the that's state. Now, um, all of these parallel models were assuming global concurrency. What if we're not globally concurrent? What if you're in a GPU setting, for example, where things are not necessarily synchronized? I've done some work with an ex-undergraduate at Princeton, Siddhartha Chayanti, on uh, concurrent algorithms for the disjoint set union problem, which I mentioned early on. And it seems like some of these ideas should give good asynchronous algorithms concurrent elements for connecting the problems. And it looks like you have to give up something like a log factor in the trade-off for the asynchronous part, at least in the theoretical analysis. But we'll see. This is ongoing work. Uh, another interesting thing is to analyze some of these non-monotonic algorithms. I think algorithms P and A run in log time the algorithm A that I didn't talk about, we can prove a log squared bound, but that doesn't seem right. So even very simple algorithms in the concurrent setting, not so easy to analyze. Thanks. Uh, there's a paper on the archive describing most of the stuff we talked about. Thank you.